Hello, uh, my name is Tommy Asano uh, from Takumi Corporation. <clears throat> uh, let me talk about a little bit deep inside the technical stuff <clears throat> today. Uh, this is my content here. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce Takumi, my company. Uh, Takumi means the super sophisticated skill, uh, like a, a technician making an old building <coughs> or something, temple. And uh, we are uh, releasing the IP core, uh, graphics accelerator IP core to market. Uh, we are located in Tokyo, Japan, <coughs> and we are just uh, 10 years old company. The Chronos Graphics Standard API is uh, beneficial for us and uh, <clears throat> a lot of people uh, have an uh, option to select the best development environment like uh, directly using uh, OpenVG API or <clears throat> using the middleware like a uh, GUI engine, Flash, uh, SVG. OpenVG application is like this, uh, some of uh, GUI implementation and also font rendering and map rendering. Uh, I'd like to explain uh, some application and uh, good features in OpenVG. Uh, one of the application is Photo Viewer and if you, you can render an uh, image using the perspective transformation. Uh, it will allow you to render image like 3D. If you render uh, with the trans uh, perspective transformation, you will see some kind of edge uh, in jaggy at the edge. But the OpenBG provides you the anti-alias as a default, so you will have very smooth edge uh, even if you use the, the perspective transformation. And another one is the map rendering and also font rendering. Uh, you can utilize a busy curve, very smooth curve, um, and with anti-aliasing, it's very high quality uh, font and map can be rendered. Actually, the map is very important application right now. Uh, a lot of uh, digital still camera has the GPS and uh, they have the features to uh, render maps on the display. And another very specific uh, feature in OpenVG is image filter. <clears throat> uh, you can easily have the blur effect uh, to the image rendering. And this is kind of an experimental uh, result. And, and left-hand side, most left-hand side image is original image. and you can add some blur with the uh, bilinear filter, uh, just, just shrink the image first and enlarge with the bilinear filter, you will have some kind of blur, but, it's, uh, but it, it is not enough. Uh, right hand side three image is using the uh, image filter with the OpenVG. Uh, you can select uh, the standard deviation number to how, how much you have uh, blur. And uh, you can, uh, you know, once shrink the image and apply the uh, image filter and, and enlarge that, uh, you will have better performance and better blur, I think. You know, understanding architecture is very important to use uh, OpenVG. Uh, Chronos provides common API. Uh, as uh, Tom Olson uh, mentioned that the, there are some difficulty in common API. However, uh, it's, uh, it's a common to use. Uh, the implementation are different one by one. There are lots of uh, variety of implementation exists in the market and uh, if you would like to improve your performance, then you would like you, you need to understand architecture. I mean that the character or nature of the device you use, and also understand where is the bottleneck. Uh, 
it depends on the applications you, you make. And also, uh, it's better to understand what is happening in API and inside the hardware. Uh, let me go through a uh, pipeline. Uh, as, uh, maybe this is covered by uh, Huan, Dr. Lee. Uh, there is eight stages. And we, uh, left-hand side is eight stages, and we implement uh, these eight stages in hardware. Uh, this is just an example. Uh, uh, it's a Takumi uh, implementation. However, we have a full hardware implementation. And of course, there is a software implementation, like a human does. All the uh, processing is done by CPU. And also there is uh, implementation and half and half. And also there is implementation on top of 3D hardware. In this case, uh, usually you need uh, triangle tessellation. You have to divide the shape to triangle. It's, it's, it's usually heavy duration. The another thing uh, you, you need to understand by the uh, you need to understand about pipeline is pipeline has the deep uh, steps in the hardware, <clears throat> uh, maybe hundreds of hundreds of uh, stages inside the hardware. It means that if you would like to stop the hardware, uh, the hardware need to operate, you know, hundred hundreds of commands to make a final pixel on the color buffer. Critical things in the, uh, in the market and requirements is the, uh, one is the minimized CPU load. Um, there is a high-end market and in the high-end market, the CPU is like 1.5 gigahertz and dual core or uh, quad core. It's very high, high-end and uh, high speed. However, uh, Low-end market uses just only the 200 megahertz CPU and uh, without FPU. It's, it has a very limited CPU power. And also uh, in the embedded market, uh, the memory is very limited. Uh, the memory transaction uh, performance is very low and memory size could be low. Another thing is uh, we have to minimize LSI footprint, it, but it is a, a hardware requirement. So uh, we, Takumi, uh, make a very small uh, LSI, uh, I mean the uh, uh, logic uh, to implement OpenVG. However, uh, you, ne you need to understand and uh, you need to care about two uh, other things. And I'd like to talk about uh, programming tips. It's kind of a general programming tips. So <clears throat> you have to think uh, your uh, hardware uh, by yourself, and uh, you have to consider your own uh, issues. However, I would like to go through uh, general tips here. <clears throat> Basic thing is uh, keep object number in small. There are, there are lots of object is created in, in program and uh, you, you need to be uh, shared. The object need to be shared as, as much as possible and uh, delete unnecessary object and, and it, it reduces malloc cost and error check cost. And also it is better to avoid unnecessary VG set and VG uh, set parameters. It, it's setting the kind of a state, <coughs> uh, but uh, sometimes uh, same parameter is set over and over. And it is better to uh, minimize matrix uh, update. <coughs> uh, it is, you can say that calculate mat matrix uh, to the API, but uh, it is better to pre-calculate if you can, and set that matrix um, using the uh, VG load matrix. 
And also, uh, you need to minimize volume calculation by CPU because there, if uh, there is no uh, FPU in low-end market CPU, and avoid the unnecessary bridge finish and uh, avoid unnecessary read pixel, write pixel, and get image separated, and minimize uh, using the uh, bridges uh, image subdivision. Um, this is because the uh, the pipeline cannot stop, just only one command. Uh, the pipeline need to run and generate the the pixels. If you read uh, read a pixel from the color buffer, you have to wait the the pipeline generate the all the commands. It is better to set geometry data with bridge append pass data at once. You can append pass data uh, many times, <clears throat> but uh, if you use uh, like that, then uh, unnecessary allo reallocation is happens. Realloc is very heavy for CPU because you need to allocate another memory and copy original and write the additional data uh, to the memory. And please avoid the uh, modifying uh, path using these commands. <coughs> um, it could be uh, CPU load, additional CPU load. And it, it is better to uh, recy recycle path object. <coughs> Sometimes I see that the, uh, the, the program create path and append path and destroy and create, append, destroy in each frame. So uh, it is very heavy operation. So it is better to keep the path object as, as much as possible to avoid the uh, memory allocation uh, CPU load. And also it is very simple thing that uh, please avoid the variable type conversion. Uh, <clears throat> you need to use uh, which is set F for the floating point type and uh, set I for the integer or boolean type. <clears throat> and please use small kernel and image for blur operation. Uh, <clears throat> image filtering is very useful function, but uh, the image filter is very heavy even for GPU. So it is better to uh, use small, smaller image and smaller kernel. And avoid using uh, VGU function. VGU is utility function, so it is very useful. However, uh, it is uh, heavy load for CPU. It includes a lot of floating point calculation. And uh, avoid changing context frequently. Uh, it is better not to change the context uh, uh, frequently uh, because we have to uh, synchronize pipeline or we have to set the registers uh, again and again and again. So this is my uh, talk today. Thank you very much. Okay, my name is Eric Narecki. I'm the chair of the OpenMax AEL and OpenSL uh, ES working groups. And one of the things when we look at today's consumer requirements when they buy products is they, they're really looking for multimedia, for, um, <clears throat> for uh, the user experience, an enhanced user experience. And they're looking for availability of third-party uh, applications. And the great thing about being a developer, uh, especially a young developer today, is the fact that this is a $35 billion U.S. Bill dollar market worldwide at, by 2014. So it gives you great potential for, um, for jobs in the future in the game programming market. So when we look at what we give, what application developers need to, to um, get into the game programming market or uh, user applications, is you, you're looking for ease of use, something that's easy to use to program. You need a good feature set, you need consistent APIs, APIs that work the same way on every single device. And you want to be able to port your um, applications from as many 
devices as possible. So if you write for if you write for an HTC phone and you, you want it to run on a ZTE phone uh, without having to do any kind of porting work. And Chronos developed OpenMax AL and OpenSLE um, to solve this problem. They're APIs as opposed to an open source framework. An open source framework, uh, there's quite a few of them. There's OpenCore, GStreamer, and OpenAL, for instance. They, it's a, um, it allows anybody to import the source code into their device. But when they do that, they modify the source code to, to port it. So as a programmer, you never know it's exactly how it's going to work on one device to the next. With a standardized API, you, end, you provide a contract between the application developer and the device. You say, every time I make this function call, this is what's going to happen. And it's, it's a, really, that's where the biggest difference for you as an application developer is between working against an open source framework or a standardized API. With an API, we don't dictate anything about how it's going to be implemented, whereas the open source framework gives you the implementation and you adapt it as you see fit. So OpenSLES and OpenMax AL provide an application access layer. This is the um, access for application developers. In the past, when you developed applications on mobile devices, you had to go to the low-level um, APIs for uh, access to uh, multimedia functionality and audio functionality. And while powerful, it takes a lot of work to get to deal with them. They're complex, so that you have to spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to set up the multimedia chains, the, the underlying chains. You want to. As an application developer, you really want to spend your time developing your application and not spend a lot of time trying to figure out how the subsystem works. And that, that's what we did when we designed OpenMax AL and OpenSLES. They're simple to use, high-level multimedia APIs for uh, playback and recording use cases. But we throw in the ab uh, ability to hardware accelerate the functionality and uh, you have cross-platform portability. So OpenMax AL is the API that focuses on streaming media. Uh, it's media playback, media recording. You can um, give it a URL to hook up to a remote server to receive data. You can have the application feed it the streaming data, and it will send it through the uh, multimedia chain to render it to uh, the, um, the native screen or the native speakers. It gives you a full range of video effects. It also gives you um, availability to camera input, for instance, a microphone, and so forth. OpenMax AL is really designed as a complete feature set for uh, multimedia to handle streaming media. You can think of it as this is what you're going to be using if you're building a YouTube-like application. If, um, you want to build a camera application. That's what... Um, OpenMax AL is for. OpenSLES is the audio side. OpenSLES and OpenMax AL, they both have common functionality for playing audio. So if you just want to play a simple audio file, you can use OpenMax AL or you can use OpenSLES. But when you get into the advanced audio functionality, that's really when you want to get into OpenSLES. Uh, if, you, if you're looking to get into 3D effects such as Doppler, virtualization, uh, equalizers and such. That's what uh, you're going to get in, into on the OpenSLES side. And um, I like to say that you get theater quality audio experience uh, from a mobile device if you use OpenSLES. So both of these APIs, OpenMax AL and OpenSLES, share a common architecture. So it allows you, you as an application developer to, to take advantage of an object-oriented design, really develop your application quickly. Um, some devices, uh, the APIs are de designed so that an, a device can have both OpenMax AL and OpenSLES, and if the device supports it, you can pass an OpenMax AL uh, video or audio stream to OpenSLES for rendering in the 3D audio system, for instance. It gives you a lot of control, and it gives you some interesting stuff that you can do when developing games, 
uh, for instance, if you take streaming media, you can, um, if you have a device that has um, the OpenMax AL digital TV extension, you can take digital TV over the broadcast, receive it using OpenMax AL, pipe it through the system uh, using the EGL stream extension, you get it into an OpenGL ES context you know, or surface, you can put that on a wall, for instance, so you can actually play real-time TV on a wall in your game in a, a first-person player game. At the same time, you can take the audio that's coming off that digital TV, you send it over to the OpenSLES system, you can use the 3D effects there to make it have surround sound for the, uh, for the first player game. It's kind of an interesting use case for it. This is the object graphs that we have for OpenSLES and OpenMax AL. Uh, you can see here that both of them have a player object. We use the engine object to create our session. So we, we create the session using the engine object, uh, create media player, and create the output mix, um, the output devices. So we, we hook the media player to an output mix, and then it can go to the speakers, it can go to the screen, it can go to an EGL stream, for instance. Or in the case of OpenSLES, we have more, we can manipulate our 3D audio effects and send it to the speakers or headphones. There's a lot of shared functionality, as I mentioned, between OpenSLES and OpenMax AL. OpenSLES and OpenMax AL, they share the basic audio functionality. But when you get into the advanced 3D audio effects, the, um, the buffer cues, the advanced MIDI, you're going to be in OpenSLES. And when you're using video playback, anything that has to do with video, radio, or camera, you're going to be using OpenMax AL. We also provide you profiles to reduce fragmentation among devices. So depending on what a device supports, it's going to have one or more of the profiles. And as an application developer, you can ask the device which profiles do you support. For instance, you can say, I support only the phone profile, or I su uh, support phone and music, or I support the game profile. A uh, game profile is going to have the 3D audio, the, um, the, a lot of uh, audio effects, the music profile has the equalizer and those types of effects, uh, multiple codec support, and so forth. Phone profile is basic playback functionality. Um, you're going to find that it, it, it's designed for uh, more of a feature phone than a smartphone, actually. Uh, on the OpenMax AL side, we have the player and the recorder profiles, where the, it's quite obvious the player one doesn't record, whereas the recording profile does. Uh, and then on top of that, there is some optional functionality which um, you can implement on top of the profiles. So if you're writing a, a game, for instance, you can query to see if the game profile is, is there. If the game profile isn't there, then you can code for your either the phone or the music profile, you can say, don't worry about handling all the 3D effects. You, so you can uh, set a global variable so you don't enter those functions. Uh, that way you're not wasting your CPU load on trying to figure out every time whether it's there. You, you query it once and then you go on. So, <clears throat> and when we're looking at developing 3D applications, uh, 3D applications uh, we're talking about a 3D experience, not just 3D graphics. Uh, OpenGLES does a great job of doing 3D graphics, but if you're going to do a complete 3D experience, you're going, you want to stimulate as many of the user's senses as possible. So you also want to get the auditory uh, input involved. Uh, so you use different parts of the brain for visualization and for, um, uh, for audio. And the more parts of the brain that you can stimulate while the user is playing the game, the more it's going to feel real, the, more, the better the 3D experience they're going to get. Um, the longer they're going to keep playing the game, the more they're going to tell their friends about it, the more games you're going to be selling. The thing about audio is that it's very hard to measure 
good quality audio. When you have bad audio, people notice. You, you really notice when audio is bad, but you can't measure good audio. It's psychological, so people can't tell you what's wrong, but they can tell you that something is wrong. And uh, audio is also less forgiving than video. If you're watching a movie and the video skips a little bit, um, most people will continue on watching the video. But if the audio starts to skip, people will turn it off almost immediately. It's kind of interesting here that a lot of companies will put a lot of money, and Hollywood is a perfect um, example. They'll sink so much money into the, um, the video effects that when they get to uh, post-production and they slap audio on it, they don't have any money left. And if, if you watch Hollywood movies, you can often tell, it's like, yeah, I've heard that exact audio clip somewhere else. And for instance, that, well, the tires don't screech on dirt roads. So when you're working with an application, you want to make sure that your audio sync is within 100 milliseconds of the video. When they get out of sync more than 100 milliseconds, uh, that's when you notice that the, the lips aren't moving right to the audio. Uh, most people, this varies from person to person, but most people will accept the 100 milliseconds of being out of sync. But if it gets more than that, um, you get that experience that this isn't quite right. So when we look at OpenSLES, uh, th this is the functionality that um, uh, OpenSLES provides for some of the functionality with 3D positioning, Doppler, stereo widening, buffer cues and pitch and so forth. We use a lot of these functionalities when we develop games. And um, we'll take a look now at how we actually use these when, um, when developing uh, effects for games. And if you're interested about the rest of the stuff in these presentations, either ask or um, you can download the uh, presentations off on, offline. So I think they're available on the Chronos website. Okay, so how, how do you check for a game profile is available in OpenSLES? This is the code right here. That's all you need to check for, the, for a profile. So you create your engine object. Uh, you have your engine object. You get the um, engine capabilities interface. You query which uh, profiles are supported. You check for the uh, SL profiles game. And that's it. That, if it's set, the game profile is there. Kind of nice, it's three lines of code. When you develop applications, and games are a perfect example of this, you want to avoid using generic audio tracks. Now, a lot of times, and You'll notice this in, in uh, Hollywood movies, you'll notice this in a lot of games, that people tend to use the same audio tracks over and over. And they, in a movie, you can get away with it, because people will usually watch a movie once, twice. If it's a really good movie, they might watch it three times. If you're playing a game, you're going to be playing a game a lot of times. You don't buy a game to play it just once. You're going to be playing it for weeks, hopefully... You, you can develop a game that people will be using for months and months. I mean, Angry Birds is a perfect example of a game that people will play for months. And so if you have the same audio track over and over again, you know, it's, it's recognizable. And in a game like Angry Birds, for instance, it's not that important to, to change it. But if you're doing a more complex uh, first-person game, for instance, you want to modify or add extra things to the audio track to make it fit the situation. And then, when you're working with 3D games, you really want to match the audio to the scene to enhance the 3D perception. So you, you want to make sure that, you know, that it really not only looks 3D, it sounds 3D, that the sound matches up with what's really happening. And you'll notice it's that sometimes no audio is best. You don't always need to, you know, jam on the sound. Sometimes just shutting it down completely uh, can work for you. Depending on the situation, you you want to vary with a few extras. One one trick for getting out of the using the same track over and over, and that here I'm referring to the drone sound that you usually have in the back game, uh, background of a game. You know, 
people will have a five to ten second clip that they'll play over and over and over again. If you, if you grab two tracks that are different lengths and repeat them, the repeat cycle is a lot longer than that, five or ten seconds. So you can actually get several minutes before the audio track repeats because the, of the varying overlay of the, two, um, of the two tracks. And it really breaks up the background monotony sound. Yeah. And if you think about it, even if you're, um, if you're sitting on a ship or you're sitting in a uh, car or bus, they, they never have the same sound continually. Yet, th there is that one sound that you hear over and over again. Um, the engine sound, for instance, on a ship, where the ship doesn't change the RPMs on the engine. But there's a lot of other sounds going on, too. And so you can use that second track to not make the whole thing repeat. Another trick is to use different audio tracks for the right and the left ear. And this is one of the great things about mobile devices. That most often, when people are playing games, if they're listening to the audio, it's not always that we do listen to the audio, but when we do listen to audio, we have earphones on. So you have precise control of what gets delivered to the right ear and what gets delivered to the uh, left ear even more than a home stereo system, which is great, because it means that you can exactly control what the user is going to hear. So by varying what gets delivered to the right and the left ear, you can, you can give the perception of something happening. Um, a perfect example is this uh, slot canyon. As you're walking through the slot canyon, the, the wind comes around these turns, and as you're walking down, the, the sound changes from your right to the left ear. It's kind of the same sound, but it, it changes a little bit of pitch, it changes a little bit of speed as it whizzes past your ears, the echo is a little bit different from the right to the left. Those kinds of things really enhance the 3D experience in a game. Here's an interesting thing that you can do, um, for instance, if you're uh, in a uh, first player game, and it's the equalizer of death. In this case, you're going to be using your uh, 3D location, the Doppler effect, um, eventually the grouping, and the equalizer. As the, um, the player's health starts getting low, you want to cut the treble. This will lower the clarity so that the sound doesn't, isn't all that clear. And uh, if you can think of it as kind of disorienting. If you can't hear precisely where things are coming from, it's a little bit disoriented, and it's kind of the feeling you get when, if you think about it, if you have high fever, or you're not feeling well, or you're right before you're, um, you're going to pass out, and your vision gets blurred, and your audio perception isn't there anymore. So by um, cutting the treble and applying a low-pass filter, you get this, uh, the audio effect that the person is dying. It's kind of a cool effect. And um, if you blur the screen at the same time, now you get that complete effect of you know, the, the screen is going a little bit hazy, and I can't really hear what's going on. It's like, uh-oh, I'm towards the end of my lifespan. Another easy trick is to use um, the cinematic stereo whiting. And um, you look at a room like this, it's fairly large, um, and even if I'm speaking without the microphone, the sound is different than if, if I'm in a hallway. And we use stereo widening to get that feeling of a large space. The echo, the sound kind of moves a little bit further away, it's not right on top. That's because the walls are further away from you than in a hallway. In a hallway, the echo is right there. You can't hear the echo, but it's still there. It's kind of in the back of your mind. In a room like this, the walls are further away. You can actually hear the size of the space. And an interesting thing is actually to put on a blindfold and walk from a um, hallway into a big room. You can actually hear this, the change in the sound. So if you have, if uh, you you can do this either if you to show that you're walking into a big room, or if you want to add suspense. I mean, Hollywood is great at this. You know, when when they want to emphasize a scene, they they put on the big sound, the wide sound. So that's the stereo widening. 
You can do this with the environmental reverb and the equalizer together. So that uh, you change where the reverb is coming from, and uh, you change the equalizer to uh, create the effect of stereo widening. Everybody loves explosions. Um, to create a bigger explosion, the, the perception of a big explosion, you can apply a bass boost effect to enhance the ex explosion's boom. And uh, the bass boost is different than just increasing the bass. Increasing the bass just um, adds a little more more uh, energy to it. The bass boost actually helps f give you the effect that the sound is engulfing at the same time that it raises the bass. Um, and right after that you want to apply a low pass filter for a short time. This kind of gives you the effect that there's a loud boom and then your ears are kind of dizzy, you can't really hear right, so it's, you're a little bit disoriented. Uh, as the inner ear uh, gets shaken by that boom, you, know, you can't. You lose a little bit of um, of, uh, of your audio sense of, of your hearing, but you also get a little bit disoriented, and your um, um, you get a little bit off balance. And by applying a low pass filter, you can get that effect to the player. Then there are the noises that tend to engulf us. Uh, the engulfing sounds. If you're in a crowd, uh, crowds are interesting because crowds, you will hear a lot of things going on. And this is, uh, crowds can be eas easily simulated by uh, applying the same track to both ears but slightly offset. And by, um, by using stereo widening so, sounds, so they sound like they're further away. Uh, you, you'll get a lot of uh, chatter, a lot of um, buzzing sounds. Uh, you know, um, you know the sounds from a crowd. But if you if you're in a crowd, listen, and you'll hear that it's not the same for both ears. And you hear sounds which are close to you, and you hear sounds that are further away. You can simulate this by using the equalizer interface and the virtualizer interface. And the same thing is true for. Uh, Weather, for instance, the wind. Wind both comes close and it comes from far away. Uh, it's, uh, rain tends to engulf you. It's both here and there. And so you, you can use the, um, the equalizer and the virtualizer effects to, uh, to create that effect for you. Point sounds are also, it's a very easy way to add realism. Uh, as we walk around, and and I like to say, it was like, I, I walk on stages like this and, and I talk. Notice that the stage makes a little bit of sound. You don't notice it until I tell you. But if you add that kind of effect to your game as the player is walking through, you'll hear the footsteps. That's a point sound, and it adds realism to the scene. And if you're walking in a cavern, for instance, uh, where the walls are wet, you can add a dripping sound. And where the water drifts from the ceiling to the floor. Now the great thing about it is if you add a dripping sound, you really don't need to add the video for it. Because if you think about it, you never see water drops fall, but you hear them. And it adds realism without having to add complex graphics. So uh, by not having to add the complex graphics, you don't have to do the complex calculations. And well, you save on battery life also, which is nice. Um, you can also do um, buzzing sounds, like having a bee or a, a fly fly around your head. It's very annoying. That's also a point sound. You can use a 3D um, effect to do that. You, the dop you use the doppler to say when it's moving away or coming towards you. Uh, the, you put the location so the sound is at a very specific location. You can group a couple of them together to make it but you never see the you never seem to see the insects as they fly around your head. But it's really annoying, and you can really distract the player by doing this. And because you have such great control over the ear, uh, the sound that the ear gets, you can add these effects, and it really sounds real. You can actually, uh, with headphones or uh, earphones, you can actually put sounds inside somebody's head. <laughs> so you can actually make it so it sounds like the fly is flying around inside your head. And um, if you, 
uh, if you get into this and you try these effects, um, it's a great thing to try on your colleagues actually, is to, to uh, put a headphones on them and, and program a negative distance in so that the, the distance is inside your head and uh, see the reaction you get from them. The other thing that you'll notice if you use point sounds, uh, you can have them listen to a music track, for instance, and in the music track, uh, you can add a point sign behind them, and you'll see that most people will actually turn around and look, even though it's coming through your headphones. Now, the shotgun is a classic. And ever since John Wayne rode into the West, and even before then, we had uh, Roy Rogers and um, others that rode into the West, but John Wayne really made this um, weapon a, a classic. And it's everybody's favorite weapon. And the reason why is it it goes boom. It has that big, grand feeling of being out in the Wild West. You have the mountains off in the distance. You're riding on the plane, and the gun just goes boom. You get the reverb effect. Um, so you get that echo, the boom. And it's really easy to do. Use the effect sound interface and the environmental reverb interface. And you, can, you vary the volume. And, and you can get that really great sound. Uh, what you want to be careful of with this sound, though, is that you need to match it to the actual space. So if you're in a hallway, you certainly don't want that big uh, reverb from far away. You want that reverb up close. And so, when you look at creating a really good 3D experience in a game, plan your audio when you're planning the video. Work together. If you're developing the audio, work with the video engineers to, to come up with a plan for how am I going to make this great video that you're doing really seem uh, like it comes alive by applying the correct audio so that, you, um, so that they match. And don't overuse common audio effects. You want to make sure that you vary the effects. Um, take a little bit of effort to find out exactly uh, what you would expect in that situation. You want to make sure you stimulate as much of the brain as possible through by combining sounds, by um, really sitting down with the, as an entire development team and, and develop the, uh, the storyboard. Another thing that's important to do is to experiment. Try to figure out how does sounds really sound in the real world. You think about a room like this, and I keep telling them I want, um, you know, with a, with a microphone like this, we get mono sound. You don't think about it, but it's mono sound. And we're so used to hearing people talk with microphones. And there's a speaker there, there's a speaker over there. And as I walk from one side of the stage, and I'm talking into the microphone, you see me walk across, but the sound is still coming from the same place. Now, if I, if I remove the microphone and I talk, you can hear where I am by my voice. It's the, it's the 3D sound. And that's really one of those things that it's easy to experiment with. Um, blindfolds are a great way to try to figure out how things really sound. And then listen to real world examples. Um, I, I like to tell people, it's like, don't watch movies because they're wrong. <laughs> um, there, it's quite often, uh, Hollywood te takes to, um, tends to take the easy way out when it comes to audio. Because you're only going to experience once. When you're doing game development, you really want to make sure that you get it right. Just like you want to get the physics right for uh, that auto wreck. You want to get that sound right for the auto wreck. So it really feels like a real world example. And most of, important, of course, is to use the OpenSLE as game profile. Do you have any questions? Okay, um, uh, the question I want to ask is that uh, in, from what you, just, uh, what you said just now, and uh, I think uh, OpenSLE is really designed for the audio. So is it easy? Uh, okay. The question is: uh, Is it designed mainly for 3D audio? No. I had a presentation for 3D. How to use the 3D audio portion of OpenSLES. Uh, OpenSLES is designed to uh, to be a complete functionality for uh, on a mobile device. 
Yes, so it's designed for audio systems on a mobile device uh, and allowed to be either software implemented or hardware implemented. So that you as an application developer, you don't have to know how the audio system works. So it, it's, it's a way to not have to worry about, uh, you know, am I running on a uh, HTC, am I running on a Samsung, am I running on a ZTE phone? Yeah. So, um, um, and for instance, uh, it's used in Android. Android uses OpenSLES. Yes. So, uh, right now, the, um, for uh, the PC, uh, there really isn't anything OpenSLES. The ES on Kronos APIs is embedded systems. There is not an OpenSL. The plan was originally to have an OpenSL, uh, but we never had enough members that really wanted to see it. And that's the key, is that um, uh, we don't develop standards or APIs just because we feel like it. There has to be a business need for it. And there hasn't been a business need for OpenSL for the desktop. Um, most of them, let's see, if we look at the PC market, the PC market hasn't been as fragmented as the mobile market. So um, if you have the Mac, uh, Apple products that use OpenAL, the PC products have the, the native Windows system. So that if you're developing games for a desktop system, you can target either Macs or, um, or the PCs. So that the APIs are already there. Yeah. Is, is there any system like uh, in graphics we have a system to build a uh, build 3D model? And is there any system to uh, compose 3D sounds? Uh, is there any systems to compose 3D sounds? Uh, yes, they are. Uh, they are quite expensive. <laughs> and this, this is one of the places where it's actually lacking for uh, application developers. Uh, the, most of the 3D, uh, um, 3D sound systems are um, studio type mixing systems. Uh, not really designed for, um, for games or embedded uh, that. So there, there are systems that are out there to design 3D audio really are uh, more designed for uh, doing audio tracks for movies. Um, with this type of system, though, uh, OpenSLES, because it provides you 3D locations, you can, if you plan the video, you know where things are going to be located in relationship to the user. So uh, you can plan your, um, uh, your video track, and as you plan the video track and the game track, you can plan out where different things are located. Um, unfortunately, there isn't any tools to do that, really, for game developers. And um, I mean, there, it's a business opportunity. <laughs> is there one? Um, is there people maybe that they can be easily satisfied with the, uh, yeah, maybe if they, if the sound is good, but people don't carry it, uh, like they carry the ground. The, the, People care about what advertisers tell them to care about. <laughs> um, yeah, and they're really, the problem with audio is that there's no, no number that you can put on it. On, on graphics, you can say, I can render this many triangles per second, or I can have this resolution on my screen, I can do this many colors. You can't do that on audio. And there's no way to, there's no numbers that I can present you to tell you that this is better audio than that. The only way to really tell is just sit down and listen to the devices. And um, studies show that if you sit people down and they actually get to listen to the various uh, devices, they will hear the difference. And then they care. And the same thing, they go into a store and they buy a TV. Uh, if you show them the difference in the audio in the various TVs, they will buy the better sounding TV. But if you go into most um, consumer electronic stores, they'll have, they'll have a wall like this, and they'll have 
you know, 30 TVs up on that wall, and they're all playing sound at the same time, and they tell you, well, which one do you think looks better? <laughs> they, they don't say, which one do you think sounds better, because you can't hear it in that environment. So audio really doesn't become a selling point for TVs or consumer electronics. And uh, as an audio guy, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a little bit um, frustrating. <laughs> But um, yeah, so there isn't any metrics that you can really advertise. Uh, sometimes they will advertise high quality audio by this manufacturer or by this manufacturer. There's companies out there that do provide fully compliant open SLEA solutions for inclusion in uh, mobile phones, for instance. Um, so if you look for one of those systems, uh, then in the phones, like, you know, and if you listen to them, some of the high, really high end uh, Samsung phones have good sound. Some of the high-end, uh, well, generally the high-end phones have better sound than the lower-end phones. But it's it's one of those things as, um, as a consumer, it's hard to look for good quality audio. It, and it, because uh, the salespeople don't know how to sell it. The, the people who show the products to you. And um, they'll tell, yeah, this one sounds okay. Well, what's okay sound? At the same time, they'll tell you, yeah, this one can draw you know, three million triangles per second and have have a, a SVGA resolution. It's like okay, but yeah, there's no metric for audio. Any any implementations of open SLEs? Yes, Android, Android 2.3, and Fulcrum has open SLEs, and Android 4.0 has open Max AL. Um, the, some sound engines do have uh, 3D audio support. Um, I do not know exactly how they implement it. Um, I th some of them use, I know some of them use OpenAL. Uh, for instance, uh, iOS uses um, OpenAL, and so on, on iOS, the game engines are going to be using the um, uh, OpenAL framework. It's an, OpenAL is an open source framework for um, um, On Android though, um, OpenSLES is for application developers. And I would suspect if I were to design a, um, a game engine that you build for native access on an Android phone, I would probably go to a lower layer and have to deal with the 40. All right, thank you guys.